forward. Okay, great. So welcome everybody to our advocacy award panel, otherwise known as you may ask anything that you've always been afraid to ask of these really special people. But honestly, hopefully you were um, able to be with us yesterday for the advocacy award ceremony, where all of these folks were honored for so much of the heavy lifting that they do around the state to lift up Indian education for all. Um, and, and they don't just, uh, toss little pebbles into the pond, they, they toss boulders into the pond. So we feel the waves of their work across the state. So I would like to um, introduce myself. I'm Jennifer Statham. I'm obviously I'm with the Office of Public Instruction and um, really honored to put on, um, to help put on this Indian Education for All Best Practices Conference. We sure missed having it last year, but really excited that you have joined us today on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. So we're delighted that you are here with us. Um, first, so the award, in case you were not with us yesterday, is in honor of Teresa Veldkamp, who was a tremendous educator. Um, she was a classroom teacher before she came to the Office of Public Instruction and was an Indian Education for All Specialist, and the Best Practices Conference was partly her brainchild. So um, really a special, special thing that I get to uh, be the coordinator all these years um, after. And um, so the award that uh, these folks have earned, uh, it's really about the heavy lifting um, of the state. It's really about the sphere of influence. And so they've just done such tremendous work to influence um, the, the leadership of Indian education for all and the importance of relevant and respectful integration. And um, they have such strong and, and beautiful voices for um, Indian education for all. And I just really appreciate that. And with us today, and if you want to go ahead and wave, uh, J.C. Jeffers from Billings, an Indian education instructional coach. Bill Stockton from R. Lee, high school teacher. Amy Williams from Polson, Indian uh, education coordinator and special education teacher at the middle school. And then our 2021 recipients, Miranda Murray from Great Falls, an Indian Ed for All instructional coach. Chris Pavlovich, who was not with us for the awards, but I'm so delighted that she is, can join us today from Livingston, a fifth grade teacher. And Callie Rushi Nicholson from Billings, who is a curriculum specialist and literary, literary coach. So with that, um, if, if you could um, introduce yourselves and, and let folks know um, who you are and why you're here. I'll go ahead. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Miranda Murray. Um, I am an Indian Ed for All instructional coach here in Great Falls Public Schools for our school district. Um, I work K through 12. I primarily focus on elementary education teachers. But my teaching partner and I provide professional development for um, teachers across of our, our district in all 22 of our buildings. Um, my journey in Indian Ed for All has comprised of um, kind of working through some really awesome opportunities and classes that I was able to take that really gave me a better understanding of IFA and Native American studies and culture and kind of ignited a passion within me to continue that work. And then, you know, just the right doors opened. And so I got to join our Indian Education for All department in Great Falls Public Schools. And most recently, I've been really honored to uh, work with OPI. My business partner and I, um, through Bright Trail Education, have really enjoyed putting on a webinar series. I've seen some familiar names attending here today, so some of you might have been able to come to that, um, and we really appreciate that, and it's been really fun to unpack the essential understandings and go for some deeper dives into lessons and education. Thanks, Thanks Miranda. Hey, guys. I'll go ahead. Um, so my name is Bill Stockton and I teach high school science in Arley, um, which is on the southern tip of the Flathead Indian Reservation. Um, I, along with teaching high school science there, I've done several professional developments for science educators um, and also have been teaching for Montana Digital Academy for the last four years um, with the Earth Science Program. Uh, my journey really with Indian Ed for All, I really started when I got hired um, 11 years ago to teach science in Arlie. 
I, with that job, it was my first time working on a reservation. I grew up close to the Nespers Reservation, but it was my first time spending a lot of time on a reservation. And we had several professional development opportunities in my first few years where I was introduced to um, some extremely great lessons and ideas that um, Tammy Elser and other people had helped put together and really watching and going through that stuff and then using some of it in my classroom and seeing how my students reacted really showed me the importance and power of integrating that um, other perspective into our classes and especially in the science curriculum where it is traditionally written by one group of people from one point of view. And so I think that that was really a big moment for me. And then from that, I've had the opportunity after getting uh, my master's to degree to start doing some more presenting. And I've been focusing really on how to integrate uh, our Indian Ed for All Essential Understandings with the next generation science standards and what that should look like. Um, really K-12, um, even though I've, I'm still working on my journey um, in the 9-12 in the realm, but. I think that there's a lot of great opportunity there. And so that's kind of my reason I'm here, I guess, and Jennifer. Thank you, Bill. I can go next. I'm Chris Pavlovich. I'm a fifth grade teacher, which means that, um, you know, we teach eight subjects, including Indian education for all. I identify as a watershed education um, teacher. And so I see science and um, environmental education as an anchor for literacy in both science and math. And I really um, look at teaching as storytelling. You know, in the classrooms, we are co-constructing narratives with our students and being very, very intentional to what those narratives are and how they protect and serve everyone, especially in the histories of our lands and so that we live on. And so I'm happy to be here and um, hi. Thank you, Chris. I can go. I never know what to say in moments like this because I don't know, when do we ever get a chance to brag on ourselves for what we do? But. Um, anyway, I am in Folsom Middle School. I've been here for almost nine years now. It was going to be two years was all. But um, Indian education is a passion and it's a way of life. So it's always been kind of natural to integrate that into my teaching and um, just working on what I believe in is a lot of experiential and hands-on learning. Um, like Patrick was talking about, where just really getting kids in there, delving in and having this as a complete wraparound is what is happening in your classroom. And that's contagious and it does end up um, spreading outside of your classroom into other areas within your district, within your kids' lives, the community and everything. So I'm just, I'm honored to continue being able to do this. And a lot of times I don't ask permission, but I just kind of keep pushing forth because this is something that needs to happen. And um, I'm very proud of colleagues and um, administration, especially in our district, because without that, um, it probably would have only been two years. So just having that support is such a big thing and having that drive and connecting with community and working with that. And um, when I first started as an Indian education coordinator, I was 18 um, in, the Cumberland School District in St. Croix on our reservation back there and just, you know, working with that and making that part of absolutely everything that we do. And um, I don't know how to separate it at this point in time. So I'm really honored to be here with all the other amazing um, award winners and even those that haven't been recognized with just what we are able to do across the state and across the country as well with, I mean, a lot of the influence that others are doing with Miranda and Chris and um, Bill and everybody in Cali is, um, it doesn't stop at our state borders. So I'm very proud to be part of that and be among these amazing colleagues and other teachers. So thank you. Thank you, Amy. 
I'm Callie Nicholson. I'm with the Billings Public Schools. I'm an instructional coach focusing on literacy, um, primarily with fourth and fifth grade students and teachers. Um, I am a third generation um, Indian woman teacher. My mom's on here too, somewhere. She probably cut her camera off. But my um, my grandmother was an Indian educator, and um, I'm now an educator. Um, but I've, you know, gone through the process teaching fourth grade, fifth grade, and then in about 2006, I started working with um, Jennifer Smith, who's still at the Billings Public Schools, Cindy Welch is also at the Billings Public Schools, Marcia Beaumont, and, um, and Everell Fox, and we started to do more of a grassroots effort to build up Indian Ed for All in the elementary schools, so that process provided lots of learning and lots of um, experience. Um, but you know, it, very humbling. But I do have to say the most humbling experience has been um, doing Jeopardy with with Mike Jeopardy, <laughs> Mike Jetty. Um, I, I think if he would have asked, what's the name of your child, I would have got that wrong during Jeopardy. So that was really humbling after award ceremony to realize how many questions you can't get in a time frame when you're put on a spotlight like that. So I appreciate that. Thanks for making us humble. Um, but I do want to quote uh, Cinnamon Kills First. She just recently did a video for one of our teachers and it was really inspiring. But she said that our people do not lead from the front, especially our Indian women. Um, we lead from the back and we kind of guide and help push those along their journey. And I think that's really a critical quote. We do that as teachers, um, as an instructional coach, as women, as, um, as mothers, as parents, we're always kind of pushing and helping to guide and help to build strength. So I think you all do that. We all do that. And I'm honored to be here with all of you today. Thanks, Callie. I never really know what to say either, Amy. I'm like, oh gosh, I could talk about so many things, but talking about myself is um, a little bit more difficult. I'm Little Shell uh, Anishinaabe. Uh, my great grandfather was in the boarding school um, at Fort Shaw when he was seven years old. And uh, growing up, I knew a lot about that story itself, but we didn't know our own history. Uh, so we were kind of on this journey together very young uh, with my grandmother and my father. My grandmother literally would take us on field trips to Fort Shaw um, up north. And so it was really interesting growing up. I knew at a very young age that I wanted to be a teacher. I knew that I wanted to teach history education. I knew that I wanted to focus on social studies and the American Indian perspective and uncovering everyone's history and everyone's culture. We have a lot of culture in our country in general, right? And so much of it can be lost. And that's one of the most important things that I think about when I think about Indian education is the uncovering of all of our history. It's not about exclusion, right? We're not excluding anybody's history. We're making a very specific point and effort to include and become versed in the history that, that we might not know, right? I, I'm an Indian woman, but I had to learn my history. Some of us grow up learning our history, but then knowing and learning that history along the way and so bringing that into the classroom and offering those differing perspectives and, and uncovering everyone's history, I think is really, really important. I was really fortunate. I had some really good teachers in Billings Public Schools before it was ever you know, funded and, and who did a really good job in Indian education and offering perspective and some that, that didn't do as well. So uh, that's kind of been my journey. Uh, I, you know, I've been teaching for 20 years. I'm back in the classroom this year, but I'll be back full-time uh, teaching and helping teachers 612 with Indian education implementation in their classroom. So I too feel really humbled to be here and just, I, I it's still kind of surreal a year later that I, I even got this award and, you know, I've been going to best practices for years and it's just really humbling to be here among such a fabulous group. So I appreciate all of you. Thank you. I saw that you guys just got a shout out as well in the chat about your materials from Billings being used at Western. And I just wanted to say that um, the conference that you guys started putting on with integrating science and in, NGSS in and all that in Indian Ed for all, it's, it's awesome. So you guys are doing awesome stuff there. So kudos to you guys in Billings for sure.
Thank you all so much. Thank you, Bill, for pointing that out. Um, so uh, I'm just going to throw out three questions. And um, since you are all so respectful, I, I just it, we're going to have a conversation. Um, so what is your single most compelling reason for why to teach and integrate Indian education for all? Um, Jennifer, I'll, I'll start by saying that it's certainly, um, it's hard to pick one single uh, thing. And so it's kind of a multi answer for me. And part of what makes Indian Ed for All really exciting for me when, where I'm located here in Great Falls Public Schools is that our um, native population is the highest urban population in the state of Montana. So part of what Indian Ed for All does for our students is give um, students the opportunity to see themselves uh, represented, to form a self identity that they might not necessarily have a connection to. Um, but I think it's super important for all of our students to really gain that relationship and sense of place in the world, knowing um, the histories as, as you guys have been talking about of the backgrounds and the histories of Montana and all of the people that are comprised in Montana, um, including including and being inclusive of um, perspectives. And I think IFA really opens the door to make sure that we are building practices that are inclusive of all cultures. And so while IFA is um, pointed at American Indian people and Montana tribes, um, it does make practices for us to do a better job at being inclusive in the cultures and perspectives and backgrounds of all of our students. So yeah, I agree with a lot of what Miranda just said. The, the trick here is limiting it to one reason why we should be doing this. Um, for me, thinking of it just in the world of sciences, the perspective of every science book is written from, from typically the Western science perspective. Um, and so when we're talking about the people that have discovered genetics and discovered DNA and discovered all these things, they typically are all people that look the same way. And what we found out is that by using traditional science, there's a lot of opportunities to show that this has been going on and has been understood for thousands of years. And it just wasn't documented or, or represented the same way that those traditional uh, science books have been. And I think it's important to show those perspectives to our students and to, especially in Montana, where we're in a state where I would say all of our culture is really tied to the land. Um, and, and especially our native cultures. And they've been observing the land for thousands of years here and understand how the animals interact with one another and how the river systems work and what humans have been doing to these areas. And to listen to those elders and to show that to your students is just so powerful. Um, that perspective is lost in a lot of the things that we do in our society. And I think for me, that's the most compelling reason to do it is just the importance of sharing the thousands of years of knowledge that came before there was uh, the state of Montana. And I think that, that that's why we should be doing it. And, and when kids hear those things and they can relate, um, all students, it, it gets way more buy-in. And I think that's what it's about is getting more buy-in from our students and creating this idea that all Montanans um, are on the same page when it comes to, to wanting to care for our land and how then we can address those issues when we, we might not see eye to eye. And my reason would, um, or one of the reasons that I've had to um, defend with those who were, um, and I don't see it as much more presently as historically when we first started at IFA, um, the funded, you know, the funded push, but, um, of why does it need to be for all students? And that was a big piece, like what Bill was saying was to say, we want to teach our children to be critical thinkers, um, especially with the ELA component. Um, we want to teach them that when they have an argument or um, when they are building their own perspectives, their, their own um, 
information that they're looking at all the perspectives that are there and all the sides that are there. And it's okay to disagree, but you need to understand those different perspectives that are coming in. And so that was always um, the big push. And you know, it's the foundation of our common core standards is to create critical thinkers and think for yourself. But when you're thinking for yourself, be sure to think about all those and all those different perspectives that are coming to the table as well. Thanks, Callie. Uh, I go back to James Banks, uh, Four Dimensions of Multicultural Education. Uh, he's a scholar, one of the, uh, considered the father of multicultural education. Uh, and I just wanna, I, for me, it's really about prejudice reduction, okay? It really is, like at the core of it. And he, one of my favorite pieces of work from him is an interview that he has, and he says, we can't have citizens participate in an equitable way unless we prepare people with the skills and knowledge and also the racial attitudes. So as long as African American, Mexican American and American Indian students are educated substandardly, they will not have the skills and the attitudes needed to participate effectively in a democratic society. And as long as white kids, the majority kids are educated in a way that does not enable them to attain racial attitudes that are positive, they will go on and vote for initiatives that polarize racial groups. So for me, it's really about prejudice reduction. I mean, it's so much more, but that's that's kind of just something that that was just really stands out to me right now. So you know, I keep hearing the theme of narratives and how we teach our students to not only to listen, but to think about those perspectives and build those critical lenses and um, the harm that it does if, if they don't do that, right? And I think about our state and the land and how a lot of management strategies are going towards models of sustainability. And it really ties to, you know, if we would have just listened at, you know, in the beginning things would be very, very different, especially, you know, I'm talking about wildfires. And so asking students to listen with their hearts and their, and their minds and make those connections and think about how it relates to who they are and ensuring that those perspectives are, are valued and um, what to do if they're not, I think is, is really our purpose. And there's no finish line for that kind of work, you know, and so, the relationships we have within the state and with each other, I think is what makes those things strong too. Um, for me, I don't think there is, and I don't think for anybody else, there's a single inspiration that goes, everything just kind of compiles. And I think our passion for this really helps drive us, but you know, one thing to remember is in a lot of places where this is not the focus, where Indian education is not necessarily included, or it's just like a little paragraph in the story and then move on to the rest of everything, we often don't know what we don't know. And that's part of what I want to change, especially with the misinformation that's out there. Um, as a high school student in northern Wisconsin, in Eau Claire, we in Lacouterie, there was a lot of issues with treaty rights and treaty rights not being able to be um, utilized in the way that they're supposed to be. And just that misinformation of, especially with um, spearfishing and how it divided, I mean, absolutely divided a town when there was so much misinformation about why were those treaty rights there. Um, just that growing up and seeing that in Eau Claire area, is it was hard to stand up and be who you are without being pushed down with your voice. So I never intended on getting into education. I never intended to be a teacher, but it just happened. And um, when I was Indian education coordinator at the age of 18 and 19 and 20, real young, where I'm just trying to figure out who I am and everything and trying to help out other students figure out who they were, just seeing the number of our tribal kids and relatives that were being referred to special education when it was not a special education need, it was a different opportunity or something that had never happened for being able to 
um, learn and the way to still be competitive with non-native peers and um, just the underrepresented voices and trying to, in my own little pocket, fix some of those misinformations and let my kids have a voice. And I think that's, you know, in a nutshell, why this has been such a passion is making sure that I can help fix some of that and not as a negative, ah, everybody's so horrible, but as a teaching way, because you don't know what you don't know. And if that's what you've heard and that's what you learned um, and it can't be fixed or it hasn't been fixed, just perpetuating that. And how can we come together and, and fix that or change that and get our kids of you know, all cultural backgrounds to understand each other and know each other. I think that's one of the underlying driving forces for everything for me. Thank you, Amy. That reminds me of um, something that Jen Duda, one of the teachers in Great Falls that was recorded for our Unpacking the EU series. And um, I believe she said, um, and then once you know, you can do better. And I really, really love that. Um, thank you all. If there's nothing else, there is a great question in chat that actually sort of wraps up um, what and one of the other um, one of the other questions that I was going to ask you all, and so I'll just go ahead and read it because the context I think is very important. I grew up on the Flathead Reservation in Dixon, which had a great inclusion plan. I graduated from Charlo, which Indian Ed for All is not as present. Through Upward Bound at SKC, I learned a lot about the traditions and values and the history. A lot of my instructors have said that I need to include Indian Ed for All, but that since I am white, I am not allowed to do things that are part of Native tribes, such as setting up teepees or other traditions, but also to not take a tourism approach. My question is, how do I navigate this? I think a lot of people actually have this question, especially in P3 classrooms and special ed. I guess I can start since I, I'm also white and work on a reservation. Um, for me at first, I reached out to a lot of people, especially we have the Indian education committees with each of our schools on the reservation. And um, so I talked to a lot of those individuals. We had an Indian Ed for All contact at our school. And so for example, I was getting ready to do a health unit on diabetes and I wanted to talk specifically about the increased rate of diabetes on Indian reservations and some of the ways um, some of the issues that that is, is ha how that's happening. And so I reached out to some people with the tribe to get some feedback of what they felt would be appropriate things to talk about with the students. Um, reaching out to OPI at first was very useful um, and just talking to other people. So the idea with the tourism approach is what Amy alluded to when we are reading a chapter and there's just like one paragraph that says, this is what the Native Americans did. Very similar, um, if you watched my presentation the other day, I talked about going up to Ensign Peak in Utah and at the top, there's all this information about the Mormons and all the stuff they discovered in Utah. And then at the bottom, there's one thing about the tribes that use that area. That is that, is that approach that you're kind of referring to, that tourism approach. Um, what we wanna do is just integrate it and, I, and that takes a lot of practice and a lot of time, but this, so it's just a part of our everyday discussion. So that when I'm talking about whether it's management of animals or forest fires or any of that, that I'm, I'm naturally talking about how traditionally it was taken care of by tribes and also how tribes current day are planning on taking care of their land and their, and their use. Um, so it, there's not an easy answer. Um, but when it came to a lot of the more cultural things, I reached out to people from the tribe in the area or other teachers that were native um, so that I felt supported in those things and how to bring those up with my students. I don't know if that answers it fully, but that's kind of my approach when I first started. Just kind of piggybacking off that, Bill, one thing that we talk with teachers a lot about when we're training them is creating units that are uh, multicultural in general, where we're uncovering everybody's culture, everybody's traditions, everybody's uh, understanding of the world and their worldviews, so that it becomes the seamless thing, this conversation that you're always having. So we encourage teachers to do some kind of 
like a unit that so it's not the sidebar that one thing we do on that one day it becomes part of a, a larger picture uh, and then you know bringing in the Indian education so it's not uh, oh well, let's read the Aoife novel this week and take the quiz at the end it's it's part of a, a greater unit so that's just kind of my two bits on that so I would just like to echo um, kind of that word appropriate and that it's not, there's not a blanket answer because it is situational in some cases. And especially when you're talking about um, doing things that have to do with uh, native practice or native culture or ceremony, there are certain things that are not for everybody to know or for everyone to participate in. And so kind of navigating that it is hard. Bill has um, a great uh, idea to reach out to people. Um, you might not be in, in a place where you can reach out to tribal people on the reservation or maybe tribal people in your area, um, but OPI is always obviously a good resource. Um, but taking time to ask the questions, is this something that I can share? Is this something that is appropriate for me to share with students? Um, if it's not necessarily excuse me, if it's not a necessarily appropriate for you to share yourself, then maybe that's an opportunity to bring someone in who can share about those things. Um, because there are certainly, and I think a lot of um, people would agree that there are many aspects of culture that lots of tribes are very excited for us to be sharing with students. So for example, in our district, we go around um, and we have teepees at every one of our buildings and we teach the teachers how to put them up and the students get to participate and they learn how to put them up and why um, different tribes have different ideas about how the teepee came to be or why the teepee is the way it is, why we put it up in a certain order. And so really when you have the opportunity to share that cultural diversity um, is, is important, but asking the questions, that's the main thing. I would um, agree with all that has been said um, to add because you are talking pre-K through third grade, uh, a lot of the lessons that we utilize and then um, with our team as we're building te teacher leaders to go out and build their own lessons, um, a lot of the younger grades are able to build on the literature that is out there and there is some fabulous literature coming out constantly. and. Um, with that literature, they're able to then look at what standards can be um, hit with that particular text and build from there. The same would be true with math. Look at which standard might be lacking with the resources that you have in your classroom. And then you're able to go and find different places to infuse EFA based on that lesson. There's, there's quite a few different resources available. Um, so please feel free to reach out. Obviously, OPI has all of those resources our teachers have built quite a few, um, but there's quite a few different examples of just starting small and not feeling you have to build a ton to get going. Um, those little pieces as they come together authentically and naturally will be um, a fabulous start and it'll just continue to grow. Everyone has said, of course, um, teaching is a personal or profound endeavor, but it requires a personal journey. And it is a most certainly personal journey for IEA. And so my advice is to start with one thing deeply first, rather than tackling all things at one, and to start with yourself. Start with yourself and build outward, you know, because those questions and trying to build relationships, then you yourself are too. And, and that's, you know, that's what it's about. Look what happened when she said relationships, we all shook our heads. <laughs> Such an important thing. Amy, I'm, I'm, I see you want to add. Yes, I would love to. Um, I think the biggest thing for a lot of people who are non-tribal, you have a culture yourself. You have a belonging to somewhere yourself. And understanding who you are, I think really is going to help you be able to understand other people and be able to not necessarily there's there's nobody saying you need to teach culture you need to teach everything about the way that things are going on with ceremony or anything else that's never really expected um but 
part of the struggle is being able to know what is good. There is so much out there. How do you tell what is okay and what's not okay? What is relevant? What's accurate? Um, there are sources through OPI, through Indian Education for All. Um, there's some where you can actually go through and kind of do a little checklist of, well, is this tribally specific? What is this representing? What is this teaching? Where is this coming from? Are there resources that, um, that this is referring to? And um, with that, just realizing that doing nothing is not okay. So teaching nothing is not okay. Understanding that you are learning this yourself as well. And if you have that belief that you are trying to respectfully and responsibly do this, it's okay to make mistakes because we make mistakes and everything else and we fix them and we correct them. And understanding that you've made a mistake is something that is better than to not do anything at all. And to those that are telling somebody that you cannot teach tribal topics or tribally specific information because you're not of that culture, that is, that's wrong. That's not okay to say that because come at it from a place in your heart that, um, that shows that this is important to have within your classroom and to not only teach yourself, but to have that as something for your students. It's um, a lot of elders will tell you that too. If you are doing your best and you are trying your best, then that's what's the good thing. And learning from that and going forward from there, like taking, like you're saying, taking one, just one thing and do that well and keep adding to it. That's, um, you know, we all want to do well for our students. I'm going to cherry pick this next question because I think it is so timely and I think it is so um, so important to get out into the open. I think we all need to have these hard discussions. JC, thank you for addressing prejudice reduction. The largest hurdle I face with my high school students is combating racial cultural prejudice. Any advice on how to address those prejudices, especially in today's political climate? Especially now, I hear that we teachers are just trying to cancel the real history. So I've been looking at this question and thinking a lot about this. I think we have to, I think one of the, I, I, it's, it's an approach, right? It's really, uh, it's not shoving it down somebody's throat, right? This is the way that it is. It's holistic, especially in history class. You know, I would take a lot of primary source documents and present it to the student and say, you decide for yourself what you, you know, and kids would often end up in the middle, right? In the gray area where you look at something that Plenty Coup says, or you look at something that Sitting Bull says, and then you look at the, the policies of the United States government at that time, and you really let students decide for themselves. Oftentimes kids would say, well, what do you think? And I would say, it doesn't matter what I think. What matters Oh goodness, sorry. What matters is is what you think and making an educated, you know, building an educated perspective, you know, for a free democratic society. And and I'm a history teacher, so that is what I mean. We looked at the civics of it, so we got away from textbooks a lot, you know, and really looking at what folks thought at the time, and, and I could go on and on and on and on about that. Uh, three kind of places that I really go to is evaluating those resources, the OPI resource on, uh, you know, evaluating classroom materials and resources, everything would, I would go through that, whether it's a video or a primary source document, even the textbook, it's really good to kind of approach the textbook and look at that because sometimes we have to use that. Uh, obviously the essential understanding, those guiding principles, they aren't boxes to check. They are for you and the student to go through. And then tribes of Montana, history and location, those three documents are probably your Big, you know, if you want to build perspective and, and to start that journey, if no matter where you're at in the journey or as a veteran teacher, wherever you're at in that process, I think those three materials are really, really important for all teachers to be aware of. And don't be worried, scared to go down, right? I encourage people a lot to go down and look at the elementary lessons and then kind of adapt them for high school. And don't be scared to do that because I'll be like, oh, there's only three things in here or whatever. And I say, go go look at you know third grade stuff that's not a bad place to start so I those are kind of the 
you know, in coaching new teachers, especially, or veteran teachers coming into Billings, those are kind of the things that I try to encourage with folks in starting their journey. So um, I, that's the best advice I can give you right now without taking up more time. I'd like to add to that, JC, because um, primary source documents, when in terms of teaching history, anyone who is, is using the phrasing that um, by, by teaching history as it was and including perspectives that that might be canceling the real history, they haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to um, multiple sets of information to come to a conclusion on their own. And we have the opportunity to give students the um, chance to make their own decisions as JC was saying. So giving students, especially if you're feeling like it's a um, controversial topic or something in history that might have varying viewpoints still today, lingering today, which happens often, um, giving them the opportunity to choose from themselves based on what they're being presented with. The other thing in terms of combating um, racial issues and um, prejudices, that's a, that's a hard topic sometimes to um, broach with students. Uh, we know that in when we see our students, whether that be through kindergarten, through high school, um, students are often parrots of what they hear um, in their homes. So it can be kind of hard because you might be challenging information that they've been told as true at home. Um, we often use scenarios for empathy, um, writing scenarios, having students talk in, with partners and figuring out how they might respond in a scenario um, that gives them the opportunity to be empathetic to um, a situation that they might not have ever been experienced or exposed to um, based on their own group that they belong to. So going back to what Callie said, when we teach multi, multiple perspectives, we really start to get into critical thinking. And so I would argue that in this instance, that as long as we're continuing to teach multiple perspectives, even if we're in a non-native school where people are saying that we're just trying to cancel um, history, we continue to teach that multi-perspective view and we continue to add those in and over time we're allowing the students to build those critical thinking skills i think that's the best approach to it i think um there's been a lot of other instances just naturally in the history of our state i always think back um to one of the first professional developments that i remember that the big thing that stuck to me was that tribes signed treaties with the federal government before montana was a state Montana became a state and it caused all these other crazy things to, and issues really between. And there's a lot of misconceptions about what that treaty is about. And, and yesterday when Mr. Lyons was talking, he kept referring back to, to treaties and how important they are. And to me, that, that's not, that is our history. That's everybody's history. That is America's history. And so we should be using those treaties in our classrooms. We should be talking about them and really showing the, the different perspectives. And then also talking about in what context were those treaties signed? Did the tribes meet there knowing that they were signing a treaty with the federal government or was there something else going on? And being honest about that with our students. It's not to, to place blame on anyone. It's not to make you feel bad that your ancestors might've been involved. That's not what this is about. It's just making sure that we understand everybody's perspective and that there's different perspectives. And because of the th way things have happened in our society, we have generational trauma that's continuing today in a lot of our students. And we need to, to understand that. And that's not just on reservation schools, that's in all of our communities across Montana. And we need to understand how to, to help them and teaching multiple perspectives is the key to doing that. I think that's well said, Bill. I appreciate you pointing out Kelly, you're muted. Kelly, you muted. There's there's the theme for the year. You're on mute, right? So we I all need so those sorry. That was that was was my bad admitting someone into the waiting room oh. <laughs> from the waiting room and then it pops up. So I apologize. <laughs> nope, that totally good. I love it. It's our theme. Um, so I was gonna say I appreciate Bill pointing out um, how important it is to not feel guilt. Um, and to make sure that our students aren't feeling the guilt and our teachers aren't feeling the guilt, because I think that is the biggest hurdle is people are feeling, um, feel threatened. Um, and they feel, um, even if it wasn't themselves, you know, uh, ancestors historically, you know, they're coming from people who that might have been the case. Um, and so just making sure that we, we know that 
um, we're learning about this to not continue in the future. We're learning about this to make sure that all perspectives are being included and brought to the table. Um, but I also want to really make sure that everybody's left with the understanding this isn't the first time that multicultural education, Indian education has been challenged. It won't be the last. Every time we find this hurdle, every time we face this challenge, we come out stronger and we come out with better educated students, better educated um, adults, um, the amount of things that we learn. And so just to persevere and know that in your heart of hearts, you're doing the right thing. So keep going. I'm gonna um, tackle this question and then also respond to Mike Jetty's call for me to talk about some critical analysis of text um, in the lens of social justice that was that was this past year. And so I think it's really important to separate um, teaching values rather than teaching the process of critical analysis, right? There are, it's really hard to defend not doing that, right? And say, I'm teaching this student, your student, all students, how to look at things with a critical lens and specifically teaching them the steps for critical analysis, which is a way to analyze documents. And so by doing that, it's couched um, in that student's own perspective, right? Because whether it's science or history, when we're taking in something from the world, when we're looking at a story, we're really asking ourselves, who are we, right? We're asking students every day, who are you? How, how, did, how do you filter this? What, do you, what are you going to do with this? You know, how do you evaluate this information and where does it, where does it land in your heart and in your, in your mind? And do you assimilate or accommodate that information? What's going to happen, right? And so Friedman, and, and I have, I've written a couple papers on this that I'd be happy to put in that folder that are, give you some citations that you can say, you know, Friedman in 2007 said that if you are building critical lenses, you can teach tough subjects without indoctrination. And that's, that's the word right now. And having these conversations in staff, in you know, within teams or networking through this conference and having those conversations first, because they will come up, they, they come up every year. And it's how can we respond to that so that that education goes beyond the classroom and into the community? Because then, you know, that work has, um, has, has gone even farther and it's a lot harder, but the, um, the purpose of that is so worthwhile. Um, so the critical analysis lens was a um, National Geographic textbook that was printed in 2017. And this is what my district has, Reach for Reading um, for fifth grade. And this is our core curriculum and what we are supposed to, you know, adhere to with fidelity, which is a whole different talk. Um, this textbook presented a, um, a Wild West unit. And it said, what does it take to settle a new land? You know, that was the essential question for that chapter. Um, this book is in 40 different countries uh, and it's in every state in the United States. Um, all of the roles were split up into settler, cowboy, miner, Native American. Only one role was a race. All of the other roles were what you were doing with your life after you existed. The other one was just about I exist as a Native American person, right? And so looking at that and um, paying attention to the verbs, which is critical anal analysis process, where, okay, so settlers moved, cowboys made a living, my settle, you know, all of those are very active verbs where Native Americans were moved onto reservations. And one of my students said, well, they don't know about the Dakota 38 plus two, do they? Because they were not they weren't passive, they were doing something. Why isn't that in this book? And I wrote to National Geographic and um, got nowhere for a very long time, but eventually was sending things to their legal team. And they, are, they said, we're gonna kill the book. We're gonna kill the textbook. It's like, that's not enough because the students who have already seen those messages, what, that doesn't change anything. And we also know that poorly funded schools 
are going to have those books for the next 15 years, you know, and so they agreed to send out a pamphlet from an authentic perspective um, that went to every school with that textbook as, you know, some, some sort of um, reconciliation, you know, but that the conversation was, it was intense and it, it took a lot of, of back and forth and we're, we're still at it because they've agreed to do it, but they haven't done it yet. So I'm still throwing the metaphorical elbows. And so that's an example of, of critical analysis. I am just devastated that we have to bring this to a close. Um, but you can see everyone, you know, from from Chris's actions, this is a, this is a national action. You know, every single person that you have just listened to um, is is a person who who will go the distance to make the difference. And um, I, I, I love seeing emails being exchanged in the chat. Please send me uh, your, your e email me your questions. I will distribute them to these fantastic people and I can guarantee you someone will answer you. So um, even though we have to bring this to a close here, um, uh, we will be able to continue this conversation in, in some way. And I'm actually feeling very, very inspired to possibly um, explore doing a, a different type of webinar series than we have been doing. So I just want to say thank you all. And again, congratulations, Mazel Tov, on your accomplishment and um, for your dedication and uh, to Indian education for all and for social and racial justice. And um, I just, I love all of you so, so much. So um, everybody, you'll, we'll, I'm gonna close this meeting and then please do join us in just a few minutes as Donnie Wetzel leads us through a wonderful youth leadership celebration. I hope everyone has enjoyed this and has gotten something out of it. And again, thank, thank you all so very, very, very much.